Today is the third Sunday of Lent. As always, I ask you to please pray for all those who are suffering with great hardship, illness, or injury. Please remember those of our own Immaculate Conception Church and others as well. I ask you to please keep in your prayers. In particular, Aaron Ayers, Nancy Boylson, Dave Hofrichter, Anthony St. Michael, Robert Gorey, and there again, so many others who would certainly benefit from our prayers, and God will bless them and us also for praying for them. Now today is the Feast of St. Thomas Aquinas, and the Mass at this moment is being offered for the supporters of what Catholics believe. And I do thank you all very much for your support for the program. It continues to grow, and I pray to much good. And you who support it are as among the benefactors who will receive the blessings for that. Now notice that this coming Thursday, I begin the Novena for Families, leading up to the Feast of St. Joseph during Lent. And I ask you to join me by your prayers as I go to the altar to consecrate the body and blood of our Lord and plead for the benefit of our families, I ask you also to plead by your prayers all during that time. Now notice that on Friday, we have again the supper served in Sacred Heart Hall after the 6 p.m. Mass and before Stations of the Cross, which will begin at 7.30 p.m. And I thank those who are providing the necessary effort, the materials, and the time and expertise and energies necessary to make those dinners available. Notice that next Sunday, the fourth Sunday in Lent, is Laetare Sunday. Now, I do have an added list of those in our bulletin who we should pray for. I mentioned also Monica Condit, Rosanna Fiore, and also Father William Welsh, Hank Raska, and good so many others. Please remember them. We have the 40 Days for Life in progress now, and March 7th today is the day for our parish, our Immaculate Conception, to provide willing and loving souls to pray outside the abortuary, the abortion clinics and clinic on Auburn Avenue. I know information is provided for you. You've done this in the past. I thank you for that <clears throat> and ask you to be willing to do so again today. Even now, we should have members of our church down there praying before their, that abomination and praying that God will deliver us and have mercy on our country in spite of the insult, the great crime of abortion. Now, so each hour during this day until 7 o'clock, we should have those down there. And at 2 o'clock, we have a gathering of the Catholic Men for Christ the King to pray the rosary during that 2 o'clock hour. The priority, of course, is fulfilling filling every one of those areas and every one of those hours during the day. And then, of course, to have a goodly number of representatives there at 2 o'clock where I'll be joining you to lead the rosary. So please make it a priority today. If there's one, one great evil that is besetting our country that is the root of so many others, it is this. It is this catastrophe of abortion, this national sin of abortion. And if there is one thing that is very important today, it is our being there to appeal to God for mercy and the deliverance of our country. Now, parents of homeschoolers uh, who wish their youngsters to receive Holy Communion, the first Holy Communion, this coming May, should contact the church office right away. <clears throat> we have testing arranged, and you need to know that. We also have, this coming uh, Saturday, the 13th of March, the 24-hour Rosary Crusade. And so I ask you to see Mr. and Mrs. Butler after Mass today in order to secure, secure a time before the Blessed Sacrament for that purpose. There will be 
a concealed carry meeting on March 27th at 7 p.m. at the rectory, well, it says here in St. Susanna Hall. Okay, so uh, please make a note of that. And also, I see there's other information here that has been added. And uh, please keep a copy of the prayer list we've had in the bulletin. Each Sunday we've been copying this growing prayer list and uh, there are so many names now on the list for those of the deceased and those of the ill <clears throat> that I know that many of you, when you do see it, you pray for the whole lot. <clears throat> and, uh, but I, I do ask you to keep this copy with you to continue your prayers because we'll not be publishing uh, in the bulletin going forward, not be publishing every Sunday the full list but you can keep a copy of it with you. We'll be adding those as they come along for uh, the prayer requests henceforth. Now, the epistle for this, the third Sunday of Lent, is taken from the epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 1 to 9. Brethren, be followers of God as most dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath delivered himself for us, an oblation and a sacrifice to God, for an odor of sweetness. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not so much as be named among you, as become as saints, nor obscenity, nor foolish talking, nor scurrility, which is to no purpose, <clears throat> but rather giving of thanks, for know ye this, and understand that no fornication, no fornicator, nor unclean or covetous person, which is a serving of idols, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the anger of God upon the children of unbelief. Be ye not therefore partakers with them, for you were heretofore darkness, but now light in the Lord. Walk then as children of the light, <clears throat> for the fruit of the light is in all goodness and justice and truth. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. <clears throat> the Gospel is taken from that according to St. Luke, chapter 11, verses 14 to 28. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. At that time, Jesus was casting out a devil, and the same was dumb. And when he had cast out the devil, the dumb spoke, and the multitudes were in admiration at it. But some of them said, He casteth out devils by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. And others, tempting, asked of him a sign from heaven. But he, seeing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself shall be brought to desolation, and house upon house shall fall. And if Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say that through Beelzebub I cast out devils. Now if I cast out devils by Beelzebub, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I, by the finger of God, cast out devils, Doubtless the kingdom of God is come upon you. When a string, strong man armed keepeth his court, those things which he possesseth are in peace. But if one stronger than he come upon him and overcome him, he will take away all his armor wherein he trusted and will distribute his spoils. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through places without water, seeking rest. And not finding it, he saith, I will return into my house whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then he goeth and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and entering in, they dwell there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. And it came to pass, as he spoke these things, a certain woman from the crowd, lifting up her voice, said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore thee, and the breast that nursed thee. 
But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Please be seated. <clears throat> If I, by the finger of God, cast out devils, doubtless the kingdom of God has come upon you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. <clears throat> well, doubtless, doubtless the kingdom of God has come upon us. Our Lord Jesus Christ has come to bring it to us. Time and time again in the Gospels, our Lord talks to us about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. It is precisely that, that he came not only to preach, but he came to establish here on earth. Time and time again in the Gospels, our Lord gives us parables to help us understand what this kingdom of God is, what it is like, and how it works among us. But our Lord continues to send us parables, living parables, in the saints. In the person of the saints, our Lord continues to illustrate for us the points that he makes in the Gospels. And really, it is no exaggeration to say that the saints that come to us generation by generation are living parables. They're living stories or allegories to teach us the principles of our Lord's own life, the principles taught by him, and he reflects them in the lives of his saints. We have today St. Thomas Aquinas, a very great saint, who actually lived in the middle of the 1200s. He was born in 1225 and died about the year 1274. This man knew the teachings of St. Paul in the Ephesians today, but he knew it not only by reading it, he actually lived it. You see, St. Thomas Aquinas was born of a noble family. They had many advantages, they were well-to-do. <laughs> had a castle of their own, and he was destined to have a rather privileged life. <clears throat> In fact, St. Thomas Aquinas was called, was expected by his family to carry on their noble way of life and uh, to grow into the family as a ruler of some kind, but he made a choice to the contrary. He chose to enter a religious order of beggars, mendicants, a newly established religious order, an order established by St. Dominic. He, St. Thomas, would now, in his view, enter that order as a lowly postulant, then a novice, and then by time work his way up through the ranks there. He would, in any case, always be following the rule of the order which required them to beg for their daily food which they would then share with the poor a very lowly lowly prospect for a man of a proud noble family and his family did not take it well they tried to dissuade him by conviction of words and then finally by force they actually took him and imprisoned him you see, St. Thomas had overcome the lust for riches of the world, as St. Paul speaks in the, his epistle to the Ephesians about those who are avaricious and worship the things of the world. Well, St. Thomas Aquinas early on had to overcome that temptation. But when he was locked away in the tower, his family had plans to destroy his vocation in another way. They thrust into the womb, into the room, a very immoral woman with the idea that she would break down St. Thomas's resolve of purity. And that was a very terrible struggle for him. He was a man of true flesh and blood. He was a very large individual. He was very tall and stout and powerfully built. And he had truly a human soul with all the human passions that come 
with that fallen human nature with which he was born and while he was baptized in the faith and had that guilt of original sin removed he still had all the consequences of religion of original sin in his soul as you and I do all of the weaknesses were there he was born with them all and one of them was that well the desire to satisfy the cravings of the flesh with pleasures and it was this that his family counted on bringing him down and St. Thomas himself tells us what a struggle it was for him but he finally wound up reaching with his bare hand into the fireplace and taking hold of a burning log and using it as a burning brand to drive the immoral woman out of the room and this took such great effort on his part it was so exhausting for him to apply all the strength of his of his will that he collapsed afterwards and went into kind of a kind of a stupor or dream or trance or whatever you want to call it but anyway it was something of God because in that condition lying there in that dreamlike state exhausted from the contest that he saw two angels come and wrap him in a kind of belt or cincture which they drew very tight and it burned him and that awakened him with a start and from that moment on he had no longer those temptations God delivered him from that weakness of lustfulness God in other words saw his struggle a titanic struggle of a titanic man as so worthy that God would once and for all deliver him from that weakness and confirm his vocation of chastity well my dear faithful you see St. Thomas also had to overcome the other great temptation that St. Paul mentions to the Ephesians today that is fornication obscenity and other impurities St. Thomas had to deal with them both at a very young age and to conquer them both St. Paul says that those who are prey to these vices of lustfulness and avarice have no inheritance in the kingdom of God no inheritance in Christ no inheritance in heaven a terrible thought to think that they would have nothing waiting for them in everlasting life in heaven but only hell only hell to pay as it were for their sins of lust and avarice two great what we call capital sins that dominate the lives of mankind young and old well St. Thomas as a young man had to face them and overcome them in order to fulfill the vocation to which God had called him he was a and remains today a living parable and when we look at the gospel today we see the conflict between our Lord and evil is intensifying is sharpening and not only evil in itself our Lord is in this gospel today confronting the devil he's confronting Satan he's confronting the evil spirits of devils and he's confronting even the fallen souls of those cast into hell the demons our Lord is confronting them notably casting out a devil and the same was dumb and again I find it interesting that the feast of st. Thomas Aquinas would come with this gospel today for the for the day in Lent the Sunday because as you recall st. Thomas was a very thoughtful individual he wasn't given to idle chatter so much so that when he did enter the seminary when he entered into the religious life <clears throat> he observed silence so well even when he was permitted to talk that he was referred to as the dumb ox the ox because he was very large and powerful built and dumb because he spoke so little 
Well, here we have dumbness that is caused not by virtue, but by a devil, a possessing devil. <clears throat> and the individual possessed could not speak. <clears throat> and the gospel tells us simply that when our Lord cast the devil out, the dumb man, the dumb man was now able to speak, <clears throat> that the devil had silenced him. But there were those who took exception. There were those who objected to our Lord himself, who said, well, we want a sign. Give us some kind of sign, because how do we know you're not casting out devils by the power of the devil? A silly thing to say, but they were desperate. They had nothing else to say. It reminds us of the, of the leftists today who say so many things that are so silly, and yet there are many who are as silly as they are who believe them. Well. The same type of thinking prevailed in our Lord's day as well, and he had to deal with it too. <clears throat> and so our, our Lord simply pointed out, well, if the devil is casting himself out now, his kingdom is divided and his kingdom is at an end. But our Lord said, your children also presume to exercise devils. What is the power that they use? And so if they know that it is a power from God to cast out devils, well, they can judge what you just said and how foolish it is and how wrong you are. But our Lord says, if it is by the power of God that I do cast out devils, then the kingdom of God is upon you right now. And then our Lord talks about the devil as a strong man who's keeping control of those he's conquered. And he has security until one stronger comes along. And that one stronger is our Lord himself. And when our Lord comes and overcomes the devil, as he just did in this, in this exorcism, the devil is vanquished. Uh, he is chased away and leaves all behind. He has to abandon all that he's taken, just like the poor soul of this man whom, uh, who had been subject to the devil's power all that time. And our Lord points this out, that he who is not with him, our Lord, is against him. That is a, another way of saying that he is the one who is supreme. He is the stronger of them all. And everyone must be gathered with him, or they will be scattered if they are against him, as was just proven by this exorcism when the devil was driven out and driven off. And our Lord continues to instruct the people by talking about the unclean spirit. Now, it's very, very possible that the spirit that had taken hold of this man was known for its impurities and lustfulness. Maybe this is indeed the connection between the epistle of St. Paul to the Ephesians we read today and this gospel, that lustful spirit that had taken control of this man. But maybe our Lord simply means unclean insofar as it is sinful and thus condemned. In any case, he tells about the mentality of the unclean spirit when it is cast out. When the unclean spirit is cast out, it wanders the earth. What does it do? It is looking. It is looking for someone else to possess. It even considers the one possessed as though it were its, its rightful dwelling place. Remember now, when we're talking about a possessing spirit, we're talking about a condemned soul that for some reason is allowed by God to wander the earth. And that condemned soul of a human being has a natural inclination to be united with a body and wants to be in possession of a body and actually would consider it to be its dwelling place. And so it wanders the earth looking for someone to possess. In fact, if you, if you do, and I don't necessarily suggest you do, but if you have any, any opportunity and need to study exorcisms, you'd find the possessing demons are just that, demons, that is, condemned souls of men who have been allowed by God to wander the earth, and they want it very much to reunite with bodies. That's, after all, their problem. That's why they were condemned, because they were so much of the, of the body, of the flesh, of the flesh that they were lost, that they were condemned. And so they want, they crave to be reunited with that flesh, as it were, at least to dwell there. 
And when the unclean spirit doesn't find anyone else, he returns to the one whom he had possessed before. And he finds it all cleaned up and yet not secured. And there is the downfall. Because when one, by the grace of God, is delivered from the power of that demon, that person should not only repair himself by the grace of God, cleanse himself of the impurities and all the rest that he was so prey to before, but he should also put a lock on that door to keep this unclean spirit out, to keep away from him. And if he doesn't, if he just complacently goes on with life, and doesn't appreciate the danger he's in, that unclean spirit may return and find him all cleaned up, and the devil sees, well, this is an opportunity to come right back in and make things worse than before, and even to bring seven devils worse than himself, as he did in the gospel today. So it's very important that when one does begin to put away the things of the devil in his life, to free himself from that control, that he exercises a very great vigilance over his soul, realizing the devil is going to try to get back in again. He can't be complacent about vice, nor can he be complacent about virtue when he finally does have some. He has to guard it and protect it. Our Lord has to be there, as it were, the stronger, to keep out that evil influence. And as strong, as long as one, and every time someone who is in the state of grace, all cleaned up as it were, begins to compromise and allows himself to be tempted, allows himself to be tempted, well, he's going to fall. And he could very well become even worse than he was to begin with. Some think that is true of our society today. That our society today is like the last state of the man spoken of in the gospel today. Because in our world came our Lord, and he did, as it were, cast out the demon. He overcame the prince of this world. And so he gave to our human race the power to know him, and to love him, and to serve him. And many did. Many of the saints we know, and many we don't. But whole societies of men were organized around the gospel and with the principles of the gospel. Now, of course, they couldn't keep them perfectly because they're still fallible, weak human beings. But nonetheless, in principle, this is what they strove to do. And so there were very many good and beautiful things that came from those societies. But what happened was when complacency set in and they took for granted the blessings that they had, you see how the unclean spirit can move right back in again, looking for the opportunity, and even bring seven devils worse than himself, because that soul was so blessed and so gifted by God and didn't appreciate it. Now it sets itself up for a great fall, greater even than before. And so in our society we might say, well, we are different from ancient Rome, which did not know Christ. But when it came to know Christ and there was a conversion, that was a great blessing. But having known Christ now, our societies and our history, having known Jesus Christ as at least as well as we could with the situation in the world, and having rejected him, having rejected him, now it is though we have set ourselves up for a very great fall, even greater than ever before. It's one thing to have never known our Lord. Our Lord himself said this. But it's one thing to have known him and then to have rejected him. That is why it's so important for us to represent him and to reach out to the souls in the world today who want to know the truth and through the truth and their love of truth, God-given, that they can find our Lord and stand with him and be saved. We do that in so many ways. And one day, one way we have to do that today 
is to represent him there at the abortion clinic, rejecting the evil, wanting actually to cast out the devil there, a kind of exorcism by our prayers, and to represent our Lord and his love for us. What a great opportunity it is for us to do that today. Now, as our Lord was speaking, a woman in the crowd cried out, Blessed is the womb that bore thee. And she, in a sense, gave testimony to the Blessed Mother as being truly blessed indeed. She spoke well. Blessed is the womb that bore our Lord. But it wasn't just the womb of Our Lady that is blessed. Our Lady was blessed as a person, totally devoted to God and full of grace. And so it was that our Lord answered this woman, Yes, blessed, but rather blessed is he who hears the word of God and keeps it. And he wasn't contradicting what she was saying. He was intensifying it. And he was even also praising his own blessed mother by saying that she was blessed and is blessed not only because her womb bore him, but because she was indeed full of grace. And she indeed heard the word of God and kept it perfectly. That is what it is to be blessed. No wonder we call her, of all women, truly blessed. Ask Our Lady today to enable you to do exactly that, to hear the word of God and to keep it, to be faithful to our Lord. The strong one armed has the power, and unless you gather with him, well, inevitably, you, like the demon today, scatter. Don't scatter from our Lord. Rather, go to him, stay with him, be with him, unite with him. Ask him, rather, to come to you and to fill your soul, to fill your entire person, body and soul, with grace that you may be, as he speaks of, as St. Paul speaks of to the Ephesians today, indeed children of light. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.